Hi everyone, my name is Lou and I'm tuning in from Darwin and um, I'm running this on behalf of CoolMob, which is part of the Environment Centre NT. Um, we have four places featured in today's topic, which is building and retrofitting in a tropical climate. And um, we'll be joined by Andrew Spears and Emma Lupin and Arthur and Lauren, whose video you just saw um, from Yapoon in Queensland. And then we also had um, the Recycle Home in Darwin featuring in this um, webinar. But unfortunately, Michael, who owns that place, has had to go to Arnhem Land. But um, I helped film the video so I can do a little quick intro when it's his turn as well. And then he really encourages you to use the Sustainable House Day website to comment um, on his home if you have specific questions relating to his and he will answer them um, in a week when he's back. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I have prepared some questions to get us started as well, but we might start with some of the homeowners introducing their home. So Andrew, did we want to, um, did we want to start with you from the Waver Tree House in Darwin River? We just seem to be having some audio issues with Andrew. So maybe Lou, we might just jump to the next, um, the next homeowner to introduce um, that's on the, on the schedule. And then we'll try to jump, jump back to Andrew um, after that. Does that sound okay? Yeah, great idea. Um, how about we flip over to Andrew and Laurel, Arthur and Laurel. Just make sure you unmute Arthur and Laurel. Oh, so, so, sorry, we've got the Recycle Home up here on the screen which shared, so I might just introduce that one. So that was um, by Michael Brand and he isn't able to make it today, but um, as I was saying, you can go into the profile and make some comments, but this is a recycled shipping container in Darwin, which um, features passive design. It has no air conditioning. The whole setup is from recycled materials. Um, he's got an outdoor bathroom, um, compostable toilet, He's got a self-made um, solar hot water heater, which is down in the corner there, um, a total edible garden. And his home also um, reuses cooking oil from the local fish and chip store to power his four wheel drive. Um, he only uses three kilowatts of power per day in his home. Um, so yeah, it's really low energy intensive and um, I really encourage you all to go look at that video and then comment on that page. Um, but yeah, next up, we might flick over to Arthur and Laurel to introduce their Yapoon place. Okay. Okay, welcome to our Barlow's Hill House in Yapoon on the coast of central Queensland. It's located just north of the Tropic of Capricorn, about 600 kilometres north of Brisbane. The nearest city is Rockhampton, 42 kilometres inland on the Fitzroy River. So we have mild dry winters and hot, wet, windy summers. In the 22 years we've been here, we've noticed that the climate is warming. So we use ceiling fans to supplement natural ventilation from October to April. Only occasionally do we need any heating on in winter evenings. We enjoy, enjoy outdoor living on our front deck, which is where we are now, with the overhead shade structure and surrounding trees and palms providing shade. As you can see, the shade structure is an obvious feature of the house and we recommend this unique design. The concrete block walls and concrete roof provide great security in extreme weather, although it's not easy to make renovations to such a solid structure. A flat roof allowed us to orient the solar hot water and solar power panels to the north. We've progressively added improvements as finances allow and new technology becomes available. Our electric car is the latest addition and we enjoy motoring that is almost fossil free. There are a number of sustainable features not included in our video. We'll be happy to discuss them if there's time. So we look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Arthur and Laurel. Um, we might flick back to Andrew um, from Waver Tree House to see if his audio is working and if he can introduce that property for us. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, well, Karen and I had a private conservation spot, Darwin River, which is just south of Darwin, and we needed a house on it in order to So we started the long process. It was a seven-year process of getting a house put on the block. Um, we had been living in the uh, tropics in years, and the whole time we had lived in Andrew, unfortunately, your audio is not great. Um, which is oh. very sad because I really wish we could hear what you were saying because it's oh okay terrible. can't hear me at all. That's a bit better. Yeah, maybe just stay closer to the microphone. I'll, I'll, I'll get closer to the microphone. I think that's the problem. Is that better? Yeah, keep going. And we'll see how we go. Okay. All right. Well, a bit. Our our problem was that we'd been living in concrete block houses and brick houses for twenty years and. Yeah, Northern Territory, and they are like pizza ovens, and they cook you all night, even when it's nice and cool outside. So I wanted to build a different house to that. We had the opportunity. So I followed principles that I found in the heritage houses in Darwin, which were designed by Benny Burnett, the government architect, back in the 1930s and 40s when they didn't have uh, electricity connected to them, they didn't have insulated water, they had to stay cool by using natural breezes. They certainly didn't have air conditioning. So I built the house on those principles using modern materials. It took me four years to find a builder who would build it because it was so different to what they were used to building in Darwin. Unfortunately, what they build in Darwin and much of the top end uh, are houses that use all the techniques that you use in the temperate zone, for keeping people lovely and warm. And uh, that's exactly what you don't want. So our house um, is breezy, perspective, the right kind of air gap insulation and <coughs> It's also, um, because of where it is, it's non-flammable and inedible. Uh, so it's made of perfectly recyclable steel. That's probably a wrap up of what way the tree houses. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've got there in the end, which is great. And um, if that was cutting out for a bit for all of you, um, there is a video on the Waver Tree um, house profile on the Sustainable House Day website. And now we're going to flick over to Emma, who um, is tuning in from the greenhouse property in Alawa of the suburbs of Darwin. Hi, morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Great. Hey, so, um, yeah, our house is an old um, C19, which is a government-built house in the 60s before Cyclone Tracy. And it didn't blow away like a lot of them. Um, and so they were designed back in the 60s actually for airflow. So it's a long thin house with louvers both sides um, built across the east-west um, orientation. And it's just on 800 square meters. And we've lived here for 10 years. And in that time, we've just tried to retrofit it. So use what's already here not rebuild too much. So um, it's cool and has fans in every room. Um, we have replaced the roof so that we put good new solar panels on. So it feeds into the grid and we make more electricity than we use every week. Um, and we put a water tank in, which is um, 15,000 liters. And we drink rainwater and use rainwater for most of the year, but it doesn't rain for five months. So um, we kind of, use town water again after about a month of the dry. Um, we've got edible gardens um, and we've made it shady in the back to keep it cool. But then we've got the productive garden at the front 
And downstairs, which is where I'm sitting now, at the moment, these houses were built um, and downstairs wasn't really anything. It was storage, but it's quite high ceilings. And we've actually um, built it in, but still with louvers um, that we got from houses that were being thrown away. The louvers were being thrown away and they're the same ones as we have upstairs and we've installed them downstairs. And then we built a bedroom with bottles. So it's made out of recycled well, bottles, old bottles that we've cut in half and made bricks for the walls where there's no air. And then in the other parts, I mean, they're just behind me here. It's just mesh with iron in between. So it opens up completely. So you've still got that airflow and it's actually just like living outdoors, um, but under the house. Um, and there's good fans here too. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. If I've forgotten anything, I'm not sure. All our wastewater goes into the garden um, and into mainly bananas. Um, I guess it's a compromise living in town. I love the bush, but because we're in town, we don't have to drive as much. We often use bikes to get around. Darwin's kind of hard without a car sometimes. Um, yeah, I think that's it. We've got chickens as well. Um, and we try and have kind of sustainable neighborhoods. At the moment, actually at the back, I just came back in because the internet's not good. Our neighbor gave us a rooster and we're um, plucking it and gutting it, <laughs> making a soup in the back garden. Thanks, Emma. Um, now, I really encourage you all to use the Q&A feature, which you can see down the bottom to send through your personal questions in so we can ask um, all our different homeowners on the call. And to get us started, um, I might flick back for all of you to have a chance at answering a question. Um, as we're all in the same climate zone, um, with quite similar sustainability features in your homes, um, what can you recommend to people tuning in who are looking to retrofit a home? Um, and yeah, what could you recommend that they prioritize when retrofitting if they um, can't afford to do everything or start new? Like what's something you've done that you would really push? We might start with you, Andrew. Um, I think one of the classic um, retrofits that you can do in Darwin um, is to make sure that you get the roof reflective. So you make, make your roof light colored and reflective. And you make sure that there is an air gap between the, air, the roof cladding and the reflective insulation. You don't want things like pink bats, um, any of those um, uh, wool, fiber wool um, insulations. You want just reflectivity and an air gap. Um, builders don't like to do that. They've never been taught to do that. I was taught to do that in the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why in the next century um, we still don't know how to do this. Um, however, uh, the other thing is to shade um, and keep cool, if at all possible, any thermal mass that's in your house, such as um, brick or concrete walls, um, because they're what, go what is going to keep you warm at night when the rest of the world has cooled down. So thermal mass um, is your main enemy uh, in some of the older houses right across the top. Thanks, Andrew. Um, what about you, Arthur and Laurel? What would you recommend people prioritise when retrofitting um, in a tropical climate? I would certainly echo those comments about thermal mass. Since our house was already built when we bought it and it was made of concrete block and concrete roof, we didn't have a lot of choice. So we have concentrated on shading. And so we've got the big shade structure at the front. But one of the things I would suggest is that people plant their trees as quickly as possible so they'll grow. And we've got our house pretty well surrounded by trees uh, to provide shade. And we've added extra uh, shading over windows on the northern side and the um, cyclone shutters, which we can roll down to provide shade. So. Shading is important, we think. Thank you. And um, what about you, Emma? 
Um, that's a great question. I think airflow is so important. So, I mean, we were lucky that these houses were built for airflow, but if you're inheriting a house that isn't, then perhaps you can actually take out walls and put louvers in. So airflow is key, I think, because as soon as it gets stuffy, um, things heat up really quickly. Um, insulating the roof and the gaps between the floors is good because it reflects the heat out. And again, I think um, Arthur and Laurel said it like, you know, we've got a great climate. You just have to embrace it. And so the outside spaces are really important. If you have enough room, um, embrace them, plant trees, make living spaces outdoors because sometimes outdoors is actually cooler and a really great place to live and hang out. And I don't think there should be a separation between the house and the outside. And I think that's where people kind of have a, a set way of thinking that the house is this and the rooms are this and they're divided up but actually everything's a living space and it's all connected. Yeah, that's a great example. And um, that's something that I can um, pitch in about the recycle home as well in that Michael has transitioned the small space that he lives in to um, work with an outdoor kitchen and outdoor eating area. And just blending that um, and taking use of where there's wind and shade um, to minimise your time inside if it might be hotter um, can really make you, um, you know, a lot more cooler and not reliant on things like air conditioning. If And that's also relevant if you're in a rental as well, I feel. Um, we've had a question come through on the Q&A and um, it is about, it's actually directed at you, Andrew, and it's, I'm curious about the choice to build on the ground and not elevate. Can you explain more about the choice to build at ground level? The Burnett design homes were typically elevated, weren't they? And after Andrew speaks, I might flick over to you, Arthur and Laurel, because I'm not sure if yours is on the ground or elevated as well. And maybe you can mention something too. But are you able to answer that one, Andrew? Yes, um, our house is elevated. It's actually three stories high. Um, and we built the first and second story um, before we built the ground level. Uh, we built the ground level much later when we got some more money. So, yes, um, getting up above, for us, getting up above the shrub layer um, got us into the bridge. That can be hazardous, of course, in a, in a cyclone zone. So it means that your house, if you build it elevated, has to be much stronger than it would have to be down on the ground. Um, but... Uh, if you are stuck in a house down on the ground, then getting the breeze through it, as Emma says, uh, is very important. And uh, in actual fact, John Knight, the very first architect in Darwin in, in the 1800s, um, said that the most important thing in tropical design was airflow. So I agree exactly with what Emma said about that. It's more difficult though are down at the ground level. Thanks, Andrew. And what about you, Arthur and Laurel? Um, I'm not sure I didn't see in your video, but is your home elevated or is it on the ground floor? It's a two-storey house and the, we're on a sloping block. And so the lower level is dug into the uh, hill at the rear. And that actually does help to keep the bottom level cool. It's protected. And, Sorry. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, the, the bottom level does tend to be cooler in summer because of the uh, protection of the ground. The only drawback is occasionally we've had uh, problems with waterproofing. So if you're going to dig into the hill, you've got to ensure that your waterproofing is, uh, is okay. The other thing is that we have an airflow. I agree about the airflow coming in the lower um, rooms, up the stairs, and cooling the, the upper level as well. Thanks for that. And um, what about yourself, Emma? Would you mind, um, you touched earlier on what you've done to the downstairs area, and your home is elevated, but how have you made that downstairs area more livable and suited to climate through retrofitting? 
Hey, I'm just walking around trying to um, get the best internet. But, um, well, it's pretty much open. I'm actually here now, so I could probably show you, but it's pretty much, there's only, um, there's no solid wall. So we've just kind of built it in, but it's louvers behind, louvers over there. I think in the video you can see it too. And there, this is the wall. So it's actually not a wall, it's just mesh. So the only solid parts are where we've used the bottles and it's a very small proportion of the downstairs. And because it's all you don't really need structure because the house is already standing um, without anything built in. You don't need anything for um, stability. It's just, I guess, for privacy. And so it's a very open place. There's the bedroom. It's just a bit like being outside. So. I guess we just haven't built a lot. So it's got airflow and it's got these really high powered ceiling flans up there. Um, they're closed because the ceiling's a bit low, but they're um, pretty fast at getting the airflow through. But it's actually a bit cooler down here sometimes because it's on the ground, so you've got more shade. So during the day, um, you've got less uh, direct heat on any of the parts of downstairs, which is quite interesting. Yeah. Thanks for that. And we've had another question coming through the Q and A. Um, which materials would you most recommend for a tropical climate when building? So I might give everyone a chance to answer that from their point of view as well. And we might start with Andrew for that one. Well, I said um, that your greatest enemy is thermal mass, so I would suggest that you use um, materials which have the lowest possible thermal mass. Um, so a metal structure has virtually no thermal mass. Um, concrete, uh, anything made of concrete has got a deal of thermal mass, um, and uh, so concrete slab floors will keep you warm at night. Um, unless you keep them nice and shaded during the day. Um, so I'd be avoiding uh, concrete and uh, uh, wood is not bad. Um, wood is okay, but it's not good in the tropics because it doesn't have a very long lifespan and it's very high maintenance. Um, the wooden, house, wooden framed houses in Darwin uh, require a lot of maintenance. Some of them have had to be uh, on say the 19th. So um, I would be going with, I would be going with um, Thank you. Oh. And it's very cool. Thanks, Andrew. And what about yourselves, Arthur and Laurel? And once you're done answering, we might tack on to your question, a question that came through just for you two. And that was about your concrete roof and um, how much you feel this is a liability to your home um, in that, do you, what about the concept of using your roof as a deck? That's one of the questions that will come through. So maybe I'll leave that for you two to answer. Okay, the uh, concrete roof does have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it was certainly made it easy to uh, position the solar hot water and the solar panels on it. And it is very solid. We recently had a hailstorm through this area and ours was one of the few houses which wasn't damaged. There's been enormous replacement of iron roofs because of the hail. Um, however, I take the point, I wouldn't necessarily recommend concrete any further north than where we are, just on the truck. Uh, but we did paint it white, we paint it every year or so to try and make it reflective. Uh, we use a ceramic paint to, to try and reduce the uh, the heat transfer, and we have put the polystyrene tiles underneath the roof in the ceilings, uh, covering the ceilings to try and also reduce the heat coming through the, the roof. But uh, if you can keep your walls shaded, uh, then uh, you can reduce the effect of the thermal mass a bit. Thank you. And um, Emma, did you have anything to add to that question? You just need to turn your um your on mute. 
sorry. Um, yeah, uh, not really. Our house is actually built of fi fibro um, upstairs, um, which was really popular in the 60s and 70s. And then downstairs, we've got breeze blocks and um, yeah, gaps. So I guess you've covered it all really. And, okay, so we've had um, some other questions come through. Has anyone considered additional roof or ceiling ventilation? And maybe um, you can answer this in relation to another question, which is, as the climate is heating up, um, you may have already noticed that your home, if you've lived in there for a few years, it's starting to get hotter um, as in the hot seasons. And um, as this is projected to continue, are you thinking in the future you may have to make changes to your home to um, maintain that you none of you seem to really rely on air conditioning um, for a comfortable temperature inside the home? We might start with you, Andrew, for that one. Can't. Can't really hear you, Andrew. Are you talking there? Oh, sorry, no. I, I didn't hear you. I, I didn't hear who you who you called. Oh, sorry. Um, um, you muted yourself before you got the name out. <laughs> um, okay. Um, now our house has um, it has a gable vents uh, to let the hot air out. It also has ridge vents in the form of wind workers, um, which are a Queensland design. Um, we went for wind workers uh, and I would uh, very much recommend retrofitting them on an old house uh, to get the hot air out of the roof cavity. And in fact, I have some friends who've done that. Um, and uh, they also, uh, they're a venturi pipe, so they use the breeze to actively pull the hot air out of the roof. Because the <coughs> The old Burnett houses had ridge vents. Uh, unfortunately, there, there are modern ridge vents that, that are fine, but the older versions of ridge vents tended to let water in in cyclones. Um, <clears throat> but the ridge vents are very important. Just getting the hot air out of your roof is tremendously important. Um, uh, actually, I'd just pick up on something that Arthur and Laurel said about their house generating a breeze. In my house, we have a we have a, um, a loft roof, which is deliberately uh, has a, has a smaller air gap in the um, uh, insulation, uh, deliberately, because uh, I want that roof to be a little bit warmer than the roof in the main living space, because then during the um, uh, very um, quiet, uh, very still uh, November days, um, the house will act as a chimney and actually uh, produce a breeze um, uh, of its own accord um, because one roof is hotter, the higher roof is hotter than the lower roof um, without actually having to turn a fan on. So um, yes, you can think about those things, but the bridge vents and apex vents and um, gable vents are extremely important, getting the hot air out of the top uh, of, of your rooms. And I use perforated ceiling to do that in, in a couple of the rooms as well. So the hot air just doesn't stay in the room. That's pretty important. Thanks, Andrew. Um, anything to add there, Arthur and Laurel? Yes, um, I've been thinking about a couple of things which we might do in the future. The difficulty is modifying our concrete block walls and our concrete roof. I'm a bit reluctant to drill more holes in the roof, but it would be great to have a solar chimney. Or the other possibility would be to have some solar powered exhaust fans. And we've got a solar powered fan on our inverter and we could possibly put some holes in the walls to exhaust hot air uh, using a solar powered fan. Thank you. And um, what about yourself, Emma? Um, I haven't, we haven't really considered anything 
in the design features, when we put the new roof on, we put new insulation in it. Um, and we just replaced the fans. So yeah, that was a bit of a shame, but they only lasted 10 years and we've replaced the fans again, but they're more efficient fans and they're made of plastic, not metal. So they don't rust. The other ones all rusted out because it's so humid. Um, and the other thing we're doing, because it is getting hotter, is just trying to grow more shade. So because we've got a part in the back in the wet, dry season where the sun's directly on the house. So we're just trying to grow shade so that that doesn't happen. Yeah, and we did actually do something, but it's probably not that sustainable, but we put in a swimming pool instead of air conditioning because you can't air con the house. There's just too many gaps. And it is quite difficult to be in a really um, hot buildup. And the pool's quite good because you can just call your body temperature down. So you jump in the pool and then lie on a towel at night under a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. And it's so tricky because these homes, you know, you sometimes need to think about if you're going to design passively and then there may be lots of gaps in the home that then you can't seal up to make the air con even efficient enough to be running. And I love what you said about the use of shading, Emma, which... Um, puts us perfectly in line for our next and probably one of our final questions. And that is how important do you see shading um, to keeping, you know, your home at a cool temperature? And if you haven't seen the video for Emma's, it's covered in shading her property. Oh, you asking me? Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess it's a compromise because we've got such a small area. I don't know how big Arthur and Laurel's is, but I know Andrew's got um, hectares out there. But we wanted to grow food and we wanted to be comfortable. And most food crops, annual food crops, need a lot of sun. And so we made a compromise to shade the back rather than grow food because you can't really do both that effectively. So we've used a lot of fruit trees as fruit food. So you've got a bit of a compromise there. Um, we've got star apple, banana, sour, sop, jackfruit, and they so they act as a double shade, the food and the shade. Um, yeah, but I guess we've changed the focus so that we it's shady and it's just more comfortable to live and cools the house rather than growing particular edible plants and the back garden now I've changed into more of this um, self-sustaining forest-like environment. It's a bit of a forest so you don't have to keep maintaining it because uh, it's a lot of work to keep up the garden so it's just plants that look after themselves. They create shade and habitat and you just leave it there and sometimes you get a bit of food. Thanks, Emma. And what about yourselves, Arthur and Laurel? How important do you see using greenery and shading to keep your home at a comfortable temperature? Uh, yes, it's, it's very important. It certainly cuts down the radiation. And as you've seen in our video, we've got the frangipani trees on the southeast side, and uh, they give us uh, light in winter and shade in summer. So they're great there. Um, and the other thing is, just with the constructed shade, we've been surprised at how often we now use our cyclone shutters to keep the sun out on the northern side. And uh, they've been a great benefit to uh, provide shade so that we're not getting uh, sun on the windows. Not such a problem in Darwin, but down here, there's, the sun is at a lower angle. And uh, so we keep the sun off the windows by using the cyclone shutters in the middle of the day. Thank you. And Andrew, what about yourself? Yes, I, I, I'd like to add a couple of points here. Um, there was uh, the principal of one of the primary schools in Darwin um, wanted to shade his uh, assembly hall uh, and duck air from a nearby um, garden through the assembly hall to keep the thing cool instead of using air conditioning. And what he did was he grew a number of different species of trees and then went round in um, a thermometer and found out which ones were the coolest. Um, he then pulled out the hot ones and grew more cool ones. 
And so there are some trees, um, things like Allos and Carpia ternata that comes from Kakadu, um, for instance, that, uh, that reduce the temperature by about 10 degrees. Um, so that there are some trees that really uh, cause a lot of shade. The other point that I'd like to make is in a place like mine, where I have to have a big fire breaker around the house because the place burns on a regular basis, I don't want the house to burn, um, then uh, I have to use artificial shading with overhangs and verandas and things like that. Um, and that's a great way of retrofitting your house um, is by providing artificial shade as well. Um, and the veranda on the, on the other side and things like that. Um, the other point that I would make about people making a new house is um, that where you've got sun shining on the western walls, um, I mean, you try and shade the western walls, but if you can't because of uh, lot constraints or you know, fire constraints or whatever, um, then you can do what I did and put the rooms that you use the least on the western end of the house. So the toilet and the shower room um, and the walk-in road are on the western end uh, of the house uh, where you don't do any living. Um, you're only visiting for a short while, one hopes. So, um, so those rooms uh, will be the warmest and you can use them as an air gap for the, the living spaces. So there, there's a number of things you can do reduce the amount of heat coming in from the house. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and that's all we have time for today. So um, thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm going to hand over to Jess from Sustainable House Day. And thanks to our panelists um, for sharing your wonderful knowledge and giving us your time today um, for great peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, thanks, Lou and everyone. I'm, I'm taking over from Jess now, who's about to take a well-earned break. So yeah, thanks again for the session and to Arthur and Laurel and Emma and Andrew. Um, thanks everyone also for joining us. It's been great to have such a great bunch of people here.